A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 26th of October 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. See recently there has been controversy over a plague placed in the Vishwa Bharati University which was founded by Rabindranath Tagore. The article here says that the controversial plague was just temporary and it will be replaced once the UNESCO approved plague are received. So in this news article discussion, let us see some of the prelims related points about Rabindranath Tagore. See Rabindranath Tagore was born in Calcutta. His father Devendranath Tagore was a prominent social reformer. An interesting fact about Mr. Devendranath Tagore is that he assumed the leadership of the Brahmo Samaj following the passing of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. So now coming back, in his early years, Rabindranath Tagore displayed a disinterest in formal education. It was his sibling who taught him, Tagore is a renaissance man and a polymath. His talents spanned across multiple disciplines including poetry, music and philosophy. He made contributions in various areas. Tahur has been given various titles including Bard of Bengal, Gurudev, Kavi Guru and Vishwakavi. These titles reflect the impact he had on Indian and global culture. So with this introduction, now let us see the various contributions made by Tahur. Firstly, let us look at the contributions made by Tagore in literature. See, Tagore's notable literary works include Geetanjali, Manasi and Sonar Thari. Tagore was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913 for his work Geetanjali, becoming the first Asian to achieve this prestigious honor. He modernized Bengali literature and introduced the short story format in Bengali literature. His famous works include The Hungry Stones and other stories and The Glimpse of Bengal Life. Now let us look at the contributions made by Tahur in the domain of social activism. See, Tahur actively participated in the Swadeshi movement of 1905. He composed patriotic songs that instilled a spirit of Swadeshi. However, he later distanced himself from the movement. He took this decision after Kudiram Bose killed a woman and a child by accident while attempting to assassinate the magistrate of Mizafarpur. Tahu's perspective of nationalism was firmly rooted in a broader sense of humanity and internationalism. Notably, his works have been adopted as the national anthems of two countries. That is, Janahana Mana is the Indian national anthem and Amar Sonar Bangla is the Bangladesh national anthem. He also inspired a student from Ceylon to compose the national anthem of Sri Lanka. Tahur also addressed the World Parliament of Religions in 1929 and 1937. While addressing the World Parliament of Religions, he highlighted the importance of maintaining a harmonious relationship between God, human and nature. In 1915, Tahur received a knighthood from King George V, which he later renounced in protest of the Jalian Walaba massacre in 1919. Tahur is also credited with bestowing Mahatma Gandhi with the honorary title Mahatma. Now, talking about the contributions made by Tahur as an educationist, Tahur established Shantaniketan as a town in Birbam, district of West Bengal, in 1901. Shandaniketan literally means abode of peace. Later, the foundations of the famous Vishwabharati University was also laid here. Through this university, he challenged conventional educational practices. Through this university, he used education for ensuring self-realization and moral development. Here note that Shantaniketan was added to the UNESCO World Heritage Site list as the 41st site from India. Lastly, let us see the contributions made by Tahur as a philosopher. See, as a philosopher, he emphasized the importance of empathy, compassion and a holistic approach to human existence. Through his writing, Tahur conveyed his belief in the inherent goodness of humankind. 
He also believed that human beings can create a harmonious world through mutual understanding and respect. He also mentioned that the end of human kind is peaceful coexistence. So these are all some of the very important points that you have to remember about Rabindranath Tagore. This year in Mainz we had a comparison question between Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore. So make note of it. You can use these points in your ethics paper and essay paper as well. So these learned points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this editorial article. It talks about female labor force participation. The article says that the number of women participating in the workforce at global level is very low. Only around 47.3 percentage of women are participating in the labor force in 2022. Despite economic progress there is a decline in women's labor force participation rate in many developing countries as well in India female labor force participation dropped from 28% in 1990 to 24% in 2022 there are various factors responsible for this low participation of women in the labor force one important factor is marriage see married women are less likely to participate in the workforce than unmarried women This is because married women often have to take on more domestic responsibilities and the society may disapprove of women working outside the home. Other factors that can affect married women's participation in the workforce include their education level, mobility, religious and caste affiliation, geographical location and household wealth. So these are all some of the important points mentioned in the editorial article. So as usual, we'll try to approach this topic with a mains answer writing come interactive approach. Now take a look at this question. India's female labor force participation rate ranks much low and is declining. What are various reasons for low labor force participation of women in India? Suggest some measures to correct the labor markets. gender skew see this question can be asked in gs paper 1 under role of women and women's organization population and and associated issues firstly let us try to understand this question see the question is very straightforward it asks about the reasons for low labor force participation of women and some measures to improve the labor force participation of women So we can divide the body of the answer into two parts. In the first part we shall list out the major challenges for low labor force participation and in the second part we can provide some measures to overcome those challenges. In the end we have to provide an optimistic conclusion. Now we'll move on to write the answer. Here the question is about female labor force participation right so in the introduction part you have to write what is female labor force participation it is really appreciable if you have any data or report to reflect the current scenario of female labor force participation in india so you can write that the labor force participation rate is a key indicator of women's economic engagement and empowerment within a society the labor force participation rate is calculated as the labor force divided by the total work age population according to the world bank report the labor force participation rate for women in india is 24 percentage and for men it is 73.6 percentage india's female labor force participation rate has declined from 30 percentage to 24 percentage over the past two decades it is lowest among brics countries as well so you can write this as your introduction for the question these were also the points given in the editorial as well now coming to the main body of the answer see in the first part we should write the reason for low female labor force participation rate here we'll list out the reasons one by one some five to six reasons or enough for this part firstly you can write about societal norms see india has deeply established traditional gender roles with women primarily responsible for household chores and care giving these roles often limit their ability to seek employment outside the house this burden discourages women from pursuing full time employment 
secondly early marriage and child bearing this can curtail a woman's ability to pursue a career or complete her education this in turn contributes to declining labor force participation thirdly unequal pay and gender wage gap see inequality in wages between men and women for similar jobs discourage women from entering or remaining in the labor force according to labor bureau data the median salary for women is roughly 22 percentage lower than the median salary for men fourthly lack of supportive policies see while india has made progress in implementing policies to support working women like maternity leaves there is still a need for more comprehensive policies that promote gender equality and support female employees fifthly gender discrimination in the workplace remains a problem in india see women may face harassment in workplaces and limited opportunities for advancement safety concerns especially in urban areas can deter women from going to work lastly under reporting see while majority of women in the country are engaged in economic activities their work often goes unrecorded in official data and statistics so these are all some of the important reasons for low female labor force participation in india now moving on to the second part of our body of the answer as i already said here we have to mention some of the measures to improve the female participation in labor force especially in india for that you can write about educational empowerment for this reducing dropouts from school and encouraging women to pursue higher education this can lead to increased female labor force participation encouraging girls education through schemes like beti bachao beti padhao and the sarva siksha abhiyan plays a crucial role in increasing female workforce participation in the long run secondly helping rural women to access regular jobs through schemes like a digital india and pradhan mantri gramin digital shakshata government aims to enhance digital literacy among rural women this helps them to access online work opportunities and resources third is maternity and child care support see implementing family friendly policies including paid maternity leave and affordable child care facilities to ease the burden on working mothers can encourage them to continue in workforce even after pregnancy fourthly skill development programs traditionally oppressed women find hard to enter into workforce due to skill mismatches so skill development programs targeted at women can improve their employment opportunities initiatives like skill india make in india and new gender based quotas from corporate boards can bring a positive change fifthly ensuring safe transportation and workplace So investing in safe and reliable public transportation can ensure working women's safety during travel also creating a workplace culture that is gender sensitive inclusive and free from discrimination can encourage women to participate in the workforce promoting equal pay for equal work to bridge the gender wage gap is also necessary lastly public awareness campaigns must be launched by government to challenge gender stereotypes and promote women's participation in the labor force so these are some of the important measures that can be taken to improve the declining female labor force participation in india see so make note of all these points very very important topic now coming to the conclusion part of the question here you can write that according to gender gap report 2022 released by World Economic Forum India was ranked at 135th position out of 146 countries in order to bridge this gap our government is taking many steps to empower women the government offers financial assistance and support for women entrepreneurs through schemes like stand up india and mudra yojana these initiatives aim to reduce the gender gap in entrepreneurial activities In summary the goal is not merely to increase female labor force participation but to provide opportunities for decent work that will in turn contribute to the economic empowerment of women this way you can conclude this question in a optimistic manner so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion this news article talks about the international solar alliance the director general of isa has announced that the isa will undertake a solar stock take this 
global solar stock take report will be published by the isa in mid november this year the report will highlight the efforts taken by various countries in regard to solar energy the article here also provides various data which can be used as a fodder material for your main answer so let me present to you the data provided in the news article according to the news article in 2022 a total of 380 billion dollars of investment took place in solar energy then as of 2022 the total global installed solar capacity touched 1133 gigawatts china which is not part of the isa had the highest installed capacity of 350 gigawatt the usa in the second place with 119 gigawatt and india had 52 gigawatt of installed solar capacity so these are all some of the important data that you have to make note of from the news article now as part of this discussion let us revise about the international solar alliance say the international solar alliance or isa was conceived as a joint effort by india and france it was established to mobilize efforts and scale up the deployment of solar energy solutions it was conceptualized on the silence of the 21st conference of parties cop21 to the united nation framework convention on climate change unf triple c held in paris in 2015 the headquarters of isa is located in gurugram of india talking about the member nations the membership of isa has been expanding rapidly all member states of the united nations are now eligible to join the isa at present 116 countries are signatories to the isa framework agreement of the 116 countries around 94 countries have ratified the agreement so what are all the objectives of the alliance firstly it aims to increase the deployment of cost effective solar energy through this it seeks to achieve energy access energy security and sustainable energy transition then it is guided by the towards 1000 strategy through this strategy it aims to bring in 1000 billion dollar of investments in solar energy solutions by 2030 through this investment it aim to install 1000 gigawatt of solar energy capacity and mitigate 1000 million tons of carbon dioxide every year finally it also provides special focus to countries categorized as least developed countries ldcs and the small island developing countries sids so to achieve these objectives the isa has set up the global solar facility see the global solar facility or gsf was set up during the fifth assembly of the isa the main aim of this facility is to increase the installed solar capacity in underserved regions of the world like africa for example africa has the highest potential of solar energy yet it accounts for only close to 1.3 percentage of global installed solar capacity so initially the gsf will focus on africa and later expand to other underserved regions of the world like latin america middle east asia and etc finally let us look at the organizational setup of the isa so the isa is headed by the director general the dg or director general has a term of 4 years and is responsible to the isa general assembly the isa general assembly is the decision making body it has representatives from each member country some of the main functions of the assembly are firstly selection of the director general secondly approval of isa budget thirdly appeasement of programs implemented by the isa and finally determining isa course of action This is about the organizational setup of ISA. So in this news article discussion we saw some of the recent data about global installed solar capacity then we saw about ISA their members their objective and finally we saw about the global solar facility and the organizational structure of ISA with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article This news article is about the lignite reserves in India. According to the statistics released by the Union Ministry of Coal, Tamil Nadu is both the largest producer of lignite and also has the largest lignite reserves in the country. According to the recent data published by the Office of 
கோல் கண்ட்ரோலர் தமிழ்நாடு லெட் இன் டோட்டல் லிக்னெட் ப்ரொடக்ஷன் டியூரிங் த ட்வெண்ட்டி ட்வெண்ட்டி டூ டு டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ பீரியட் வித் குஜராத் ஃபாலோயிங் அண்ட் ராஜஸ்தான் செக்யூரிங் த தேர்ட் பொசிஷன் திஸ் இஸ் அபவுட் த நியூஸ் ஆர்டிகல் கிவன் ஹியர் ஸோ இன் அவர் டிஸ்கஷன் டுடே வில் சி அ ஃபியூ ஃபேக்ட்ஸ் அபவுட் லிக்னைட் இட்ஸ் அப்ளிகேஷன் அண்ட் ஆல்சோ இட்ஸ் டிஸ்ட்ரிபியூஷன் நான் பிஃபோர் தேட் வில் ஜஸ்ட் ப்ரஷ் அப் சம் ஆஃப் த பேசிக்ஸ் சி கோல் ஃபார்ம்ஸ் த்ரூ அ ப்ராசஸ் கால்ட் கார்பனைசேஷன் Let me explain the process of carbonization very briefly now. See millions of years ago in certain circumstances prehistoric forest got submerged and buried under the soil due to the process of sedimentation. As they got buried the natural decomposition of the forest stopped. Instead of decomposition due to increasing pressure and temperature the elements like hydrogen and oxygen are forced out of the dead plant material as h2 and o2 were flushed out of the buried plant materials they became carbon rich in addition to this physical changes also happen due to high pressure and temperature in time material that had been previously dead plant became coal the older the coal the more time the plant material will be placed under high pressure and temperature and more carbon and oxygen will be forced out this will result in higher carbon content in it and higher will be the quality of coal now this process is called the process of carbonization so depending upon the amount of carbon content we can classify the coal into three types as we saw earlier the older the coal the amount of carbon content in coal increases so we have the anthracite or carboniferous coal then bituminous or gondwana coal and tertiary or lignite coal all these are classified based upon carbon content in it so in today's discussion we are going to focus only on the lignite coal lignite is also called tertiary coal as this coal belongs to the tertiary period the tertiary period occurs some 50 million years ago in other words lignite is the youngest coal so the carbon content in this coal is very low and the moisture content is high lignite is also called brown coal due to its color in india lignite deposits are primarily located in the tertiary sediments in the southern and western parts of the peninsula shield It is mainly found in Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Jammu and Kashmir, Odisha, Kerala and West Bengal according to the provisional statistics released by the Union Ministry of Coal. Worldwide the largest lignite producer is China. The other major lignite producers are Indonesia, Germany, Turkey and the Russian Federation. So these are all some of the basic facts about lignite. Now we'll see applications of lignite. See firstly it is used in the production of electricity for example in the navyly thermal power station lignite is the primary fuel secondly in european countries lignite is used in addition to firewoods for home heating during winter but the use of lignite in home heating is slowly declining recently thirdly in agriculture lignite is used as a biological pest control Apart from this lignite is used in the production of natural gas in gasification plants then it is used in the production of fertilizers it is also used as an industrial absorbent finally it is used in the production of oil well drilling mud the oil well drilling mud made using lignite reduces fluid loss during drilling so these are all some of the applications of lignite so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Take a look at this opinion page article. As we all know currently a conflict is going on between Israel and Hamas group that is based in the Gaza strip. The Hamas group is being supported by the Hezbollah group that is based in Lebanon. While this is on one side on the other hand two NGOs has accused the Israeli army of using bombs containing white phosphorus on areas belonging to Gaza strip and Lebanon. So based on these allegations only this news article is written here the article also speaks about the applications and harmful effects of the white phosphorus so in this news article discussion let us understand some facts about white phosphorus see white phosphorus is produced from phosphate containing rocks when these phosphate containing rocks are heated in a furnace with the presence of carbon and silica white phosphorus are produced these white phosphorus is a 
toxic chemical substance that looks like waxy crystalline solid it generally appears in white or yellowish color sometimes it may also appear colorless note that white phosphorus turns dark when it is exposed to light the smell of white phosphorus sometimes resembles the smell of garlic remember the white phosphorus ignites instantly when it comes into contact with oxygen once ignited white phosphorus is very difficult to extinguish this is because of the wax like property of white phosphorus which gets stick on to the surfaces like skin or clothes so with these basic understanding of the white phosphorus now let us look into the applications of white phosphorus firstly white phosphorus is used in the industries to manufacture certain chemicals like phosphoric acid phosphates and so on these chemicals are in turn used in fertilizers detergents and other cleaning materials secondly white phosphorus is used as a pesticide because of its toxic properties it is even used as a rodenticide to kill rodents in the agri fields like rat mice and chipmunks thirdly white phosphorus is used in ammunition and fireworks as a incendiary agent here the term incendiary means the ability to catch fire easily this is why they are used as an incendiary agent in bombs and fireworks fourthly white phosphorus is used as a smoke agent in battlefields when white phosphorus gets burnt it produces clouds of irritating white smoke this white smoke causes a variety of harm to humans finally white phosphorus is used in the manufacturing of computer chips metal alloys glowing paints and special glasses so these are all the applications of white phosphorus now we'll see about the harmful effects of the white phosphorus see as i said in the beginning white phosphorus is a toxic chemical substance so white phosphorus is harmful to human and environment by all routes of exposure Direct exposure to white phosphorus can cause deep and severe burns on the skin and over exposure of the white phosphorus can cause cardiovascular effects kidney failure and nerve damage in humans apart from this the smoke coming from burning of white phosphorus is harmful to the eyes and respiratory tract the smoke causes severe irritation in the eyes despite all these harmful features of the white phosphorus it is used in ammunition White phosphorus is not considered as a chemical weapon because its operational utility is primarily due to heat and smoke rather than toxicity. So white phosphorus ammunition are not under a blanket ban. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about white phosphorus. With these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. The news article says that National Financial Reporting Authority NFRA is investigating an audit firm which is responsible for auditing Adani Group. This investigation by NFRA is part of a broader inquiry into Adani Group companies. This is about the news article given here. So in this context let us revise about what is this National Financial Reporting Authority NFRA. See NFRA is a regulatory body responsible for overseeing and regulating the auditing professions. NFRA was established in 2018 by the central government under Companies Act 2013. It is basically an audit regulator. Its account is monitored by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. It is headquartered in New Delhi. Talking about its objective, it was established to enhance the quality and reliability of financial reporting, especially for companies that are subjected to public interest. The NFRA plays a crucial role in ensuring transparency, accountability and adherence to accounting and auditing standards. Talking about its composition, see NFRA is headed by a chairperson and has other members not exceeding 15. The chairperson shall be a person of eminence and having expertise in accountancy, auditing, finance or law. Remember the chairman along with other members are appointed by the central government talking about the powers of nfra see it can undertake investigations related to the wide range of companies and corporates including all listed companies as well as large unlisted companies when professionals or other misconduct is proved in auditing nfra has the power to impose the penalty on both individuals and companies talking about the functions of nfra 
Firstly, NFRA is responsible for formulating and monitoring accounting and auditing standards to maintain consistency and quality in financial reporting. Secondly, NFRA investigates instances of non-compliance with auditing standards and takes appropriate actions against auditors found guilt of professional misconduct. Thirdly, NFRA supervises the work of auditors ensuring that they maintain professional standards and ethical conduct in their audits. Fourthly, it promotes transparency and reliability. The NFRA aims to enhance transparency and reliability in financial report providing stakeholders with accurate and trustworthy financial information. Lastly, it safeguards public interest. By regulating the auditing and accounting professions, the NFRA protects the interest of investors, stakeholders and the public. These are all some of the notable functions of NFRA. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at this first question. Here four statements are given and you have to find how many statements given here is or are correct. Here the question asks why India import coal despite it has abundant coal reserves. Statement 1 says non-availability of coking grade coal. This statement is actually correct. India produces only bituminous coal which is not a coking grade coal. So the bituminous coal cannot be used in iron and steel plants. So this statement is correct. Statement 2 says imported coal is cheaper than the coal produced in India. This statement is incorrect because imported coal is actually costlier than the coal produced in India. Statement 3 says infrastructure bottlenecks and lack of proper connectivity between coal fields and the thermal power plants. Fourth statement says the majority of coal in India is found in tribal and ecologically sensitive areas making it difficult to mine third and fourth statement are correct here. So the correct answer for the question is option C only 3 because the second statement here is incorrect. Moving on this question is about one sun one world one grid initiative. Four statements are given and you have to find how many statements given here is or are correct. Statement 1 says ISA will implement the initiative. Statement 2 says the OSOWOW was conceived during the first assembly of the International Solar Alliance. Statement 3 says UK's Green Grids Initiative GGI merged with the OSOWOG initiative during the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow. Statement 4 says it aims to create a common grid use to transfer renewable energy power. Here all the statements given here are correct. So the correct answer for the question is option D all four. Moving on, look at this question. Which of the following national leaders relinquished knighthood? The correct answer for this question is option C, 1 and 3 only. This is because in the discussion itself we saw that Tahur gave up his knighthood. Likewise, Subramanya Ayer, he also gave up his knighthood against British government's treatment of home rule league leaders. So correct answer here is option C, 1 and 3 only. Now look at this question about NFRA. The question asks what is the primary objective of establishing National Financial Reporting Authority NFRA in India. See the correct answer here is option C enhancing the quality of auditing. It is the primary objective of NFRA. With this let us conclude the discussion. If you like the video hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Now thank you for listening.